Today I'm going to review Poke Park 2 Wonders Beyond, so the background information on the game. Oh, I'm going to like reviewing sequels. For those of you who want to know about the plot, the first game has absolutely nothing to do with the second besides the name. I don't even know if it's the same Pikachu. If you still want the summary of the epic plot of the Poke Park series so far, go watch the previous video. The plot this time, Pokémon are disappearing into the Wish Park, Pikachu and his friend Piplup go into the Wish Park after being promised cake, and upon entering the first Wish Park, they learn that they have entered a dreamlike world and the cake isn't a lie. The first Wish Park is actually made out of cake. Ah, I'm back in Ninjabred, man! This isn't a dream, it's a nightmare! What cruel god bestowed this fate upon me? Upon trying to do the smart thing and get the hell away from Ninja Bread Man, two giant hands appear and try and stop them from escaping. Piplup sacrifices himself to make sure that Pikachu and Oshawott escape. Pikachu and Oshawott are then traveling around the Poke Park, making friends to try and save the Pokémon that have been trapped in the Wish Park, along with Piplup. At least this time, the plot isn't the result of Mew being lazy, and nobody's going to die a horrible, painful death. And later you find out that there is a black hole that could destroy the entire world. As with the previous game, it's a giant sugar bowl, and it will have the ability to give you diabetes upon looking at it. It's super cute. You're once again traveling around in a light Zelda-style adventure game. This time, you can switch between four characters at will. Oshawott is able to swim in the water, Princess Snivy is able to double jump, and seems to be the fastest, Tepig allows you to smash through rocks, and Pikachu is Pikachu. There are some electric panels that you need to shoot electricity at to make stuff happen, but it feels forced and tacked on, so he wasn't completely outshined by the others. Occasionally, there is a 2.5D platforming segment, requiring you to switch between the Pokémon to complete an obstacle course. It amounts to using the abilities on the overworld on a 2D plane. The attractions have been reduced from the mixed bag of 14 bad repetitive OK or short minigames that would put WarioWare to shame to 4 surprisingly good minigames. This time, I like the minigames a lot more. Sure you look stupid doing some of the stuff, but I'm 23 and playing Pokémon, I already look stupid and have been disowned by most of my extended family anyways, why do I care? Once again, guess what the minigames use? Sorry, he's already had his cameo in this video. The first minigame is a shooting minigame that uses the IR pointer and has two tiers. You shoot at Patrots and Watchhogs, who are holding something. The second tier is shooting at cakes, originally as a raindrop batter, to spontaneously shape and cook them and then, once again, to frost them. It's a dream world, it doesn't have to make sense. The second attraction is a dancing minigame. I have no idea if this is similar to Just Dance or any other dancing games as I haven't played them. There is a bar displaying the movements that you're supposed to do and you're supposed to follow along. I'd say it's worth it to play just to see Oshawott dance. The third attraction is knocking Pokémon away and trying to avoid hitting bombs. It's where that completely awesome Storming the Castle segment came from in the trailer. The fourth attraction is flying through space. Hey look, a flying pig! Maybe Earthbound does have a chance of being released on the virtual console. You're just trying to get jewels while doing three laps around Not Rainbow Road. It plays identically to Salamence's Air Race and Pelipper's Circle Circuit from the first game. Upon beating them in the single-player game, you gain the ability to play them as multiplayer games. This time, the attractions you can play only as Pikachu, Oshawott, Snivy, and Tepig, as opposed to the first game where you could play as any Pokémon you became a friend with. Getting Pokémon to be your friends was mostly the same. This time it was more streamlined, as at times you could befriend multiple Pokémon at the same time. You also gain friends during your investigation. To gain friends, you still do chase, battles, quizzes, hide-and-seek. There are also several new ways to get friends. Some Pokémon will ask for photos of other Pokémon. You use the minus button to take a photo. Why hasn't there been a Pokémon Snap sequel yet? You're just taunting me, aren't you? After taking the photo and giving it to them, they will become your friend. There are also collectible items that are lying around at predetermined spots. Some Pokémon require a certain amount of them, and they will become your friend. The real-time battles, being one of the best things in the previous games, comes back, and have been improved. With the ability to be Oshawott, Snivy, and Tepig as well, it's much better as there is variety. Unfortunately, you're unable to switch between them during battle. The elements types do apply, and actually feel much better as opposed to the previous game where it was just Thundershock doesn't work on ground types. If you think that battles are too easy, you can easily be a Pokémon that has the type disadvantage. Some Pokémon have flunkies that will try and distract you. These, however, are few and far between and are regulated to storyline battles. The A button is no longer used for Thundershock. Now most attacks are done by using the 1 button. If if you're close to losing, you can call in some friends to assist you. Once again, the central area acts as a training ground. Audino improves the health of each Pokémon, Blitzel increases their dash and speed, and each Pokémon has one of their evolved forms that will make them their apprentice and train them. Unfortunately, I don't think that these battles have reached their full potential yet. 
For starters, there's still no two-player modes for the battles. I'm sorry, I know I said this during my last Poke Park review, but I've been waiting since the first Pokemon Stadium for a battle system like this, and to see it not reach its full potential is just aggravating. This battle system combined with multiplayer could work wonders for the game. Imagine a free-for-all four-player battle, or four people working together to try and take down a single super strong Pokemon. And before anyone says anything, no, Pokemon Rumble doesn't count. The game also has boss battles. Part of the first boss battle is against a giant cake. Part of the second boss battle is against lights, speakers, and a disco ball. Rather than keep the wacky theme and fighting against things that you wouldn't normally think of as a boss battle unless you've played Super Mario RPG, the third and fourth boss battles just opt to have you getting past a swarm of Pokémon, which was rather disappointing. Battling against a cake worked because it was a dreamlike world. You could get away with things that didn't make sense. The locations are varied. There is some overlap from the previous game, where there was also a beach, forest, and a meadow, but they managed to be different enough so that it doesn't feel copy and pasted. The beach this time is more of a cove. The ability to swim in water also helps in making it different. The Wish Park allows for more fantasy-based theme parks. The first being food-based, the second being a club and being the odd one out, the third one was a castle, and the fourth was a futuristic area. Compared to the normal parks, they are rather small and linear. They're not open like the previous areas. It's just twisting paths to get to the attraction, followed by a path from the attraction to a bell that you have to ring to free the Pokémon who are under Wish Park's magic. The controls didn't bug me. The only time I think I had problems was during the dancing game, but I just thought that was because I can't dance and I have no rhythm. There was also one area where I kept on falling down, but it wasn't because of the controls, it was because I was trying to rush through it. When I switched to a slower Pokémon and took my time, I was able to get past it. In the review of the last game, I said that the loading screens were surprisingly one of the better things about the game. And once again, the loading screens don't disappoint. There's a whole slew of new loading screens, either featuring the Pokémon you're currently playing as or the group. And they are adorable. Once again, I was actually waiting for the loading screens just to see if there was a new one that I got. Though, towards the end of the game, the loading felt way too frequent. I was able to beat the game in just under 7 hours, only getting the minimal amount of Pokémon to be my friends. Unlike the first game, I was willing to jump right back into the game and replay it to get the footage for the review. There is also some post-game content that lasts about 2 hours. It involves saving the Pokémon that was sucked into the Dark Vortex. Yes, because Pokémon would be able to survive being crushed by gravity. There is also a tournament, however I didn't finish that to see how much longer it would take. You can also replay the minigames to try and get a high score and be rewarded a large amount of berries. I found the game enjoyable and a rather good time waster. It's cute and definitely not for my age group. It's for the younger fans of the series. Is it a good game? Not really. What it is is an improved sequel. I could actually make it through the game without forcing myself through like I did with the first one. It's not the best Pokemon spin-off out there, but it's far from being the worst. Despite only having four minigames, there are leagues better than the majority that were in the previous game. At its core, it's repetitive and will be good for one playthrough. As an adventure game, it doesn't do anything new. There isn't a lot of exploration or hidden areas for you to find. The padding isn't as bad as the previous game. There was only two spots that I would call padding. The first was where you had to find three Pokémon so they could open up a door, and the second was towards the end of the main game where you had to go back through the previous areas and you can't use the warp system because of the giant black hole in the sky. For what it is, it's expensive. It should have been at a discounted price of $29.99 like Rhythm Heaven Fever. Unfortunately, since I still see the first game new for $49.99, the price doesn't look like it will drop anytime soon. My recommendation can only go to Pokemon diehards and younger fans.